So yeah, just a little bit about us. Uh, we're sort of a medium-sized research centre. We're about 120 staff, a um, couple of hundred computers. Um, and sort of cognitive science as a, as a discipline is really uh, wide-ranging. So we've got psychologists, linguists, neuroscientists, computer scientists, uh, even philosophers. Um, and why, why I bring that up is that we use a really, really wide range of operating systems and, and software. So, you know, we need to run things that run on Mac, Windows, um, X11, Unix apps. So you can see in this screenshot here, this is someone's desktop. It's quite busy. They're running uh, Unix apps. Uh, they're interacting with that from MATLAB scripts. Uh, so it can get quite complicated. Um, we even still have a few uh, uh, DOS applications and one OS9 user that I can't shake, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, so for us, standardisation has always been a really big issue, and you know, I'm sure it is for you guys as well. Um, but for uh, Windows on our desktops, we've, we've standardised on boot camp for, for everyone, which is probably a bit unusual. But um, you know, we've got some reasons why we've done that, just to go into the history of uh, our centre. I've, I've been here for a long time. So sort of in, in the early days, uh, people tended to have a Windows or a Mac computer. Um, relatively, they weren't that powerful, and so all of their heavy listing, lifting was done on uh, Unix servers. Um, as things moved on a bit, people started to have two computers on their desktops um, that have a Windows computer and a Mac computer. And there was this idea that your Mac computer now had OS X, was sort of a, a portable Unix, and then the demand on our uh, Unix servers really sort of started to go down. But our hardware costs were going up quite dramatically at this time. Um, but, you know, everything changed when the, the Intel Mac came out. So, you know, people started to get everything they needed on one computer, but the, the, the way that we were deploying Windows was really varied. So, you know, some people ran Fusion, some ran Parallel, some Boot Camp. I was becoming a bit of a support nightwear, and we still had lots of Windows PCs um, kicking around the place as well. Um, so it was about 2010 we decided to just, you know, give everyone boot camp and make that our only Windows deployment on the desktop. Um, and that's even for people who don't use OS X. Um, so basically, someone turns up, they're, they're given a Mac, and they've got, you know, all the OSs they want, and even the ones they don't even need, know they need yet. Um, but look, before I go on any more, because it gets confused quite a bit, I'll just briefly go into what boot camp is. As a term, I'm just referring to anything involved in making Windows boot natively on, on your Mac. So, you know, that can be, you know, Apple's changes to the firmware, uh, their boot camp assistant for installing it, um, their packaged set of drivers that you need to install after Windows is installed, um, and even the little boot camp utility in Windows that allows you to reboot into OS X. But, Importantly, when you're dealing with your users, you need to sort of know what boot camp isn't. So a lot of people will think that when you say you're giving them a boot camp Mac, that you're giving them something virtual. So, you know, t tell them up front that's not what this is. Um, and it's nothing to do with, you know, other uh, Apple apps for Windows. Um, but importantly, tell them it's not magic because there's this idea with users still that what you're giving them somehow isn't real Windows. It's, it's you know... You know, pigs had to fly for this to get onto their, onto their um, Mac, but that's just not true. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later. But, uh, you know, you're probably still thinking, you know, why not use virtualization? It's really cool and it's really easy. But um, in the field we're in, we really care about timing and milliseconds. And, you know, the science we do means the computers have to be very accurate because we're measuring responses that your brain is making once it's shown various things on, on the screen. So um, even though most of our desktop Macs are not collecting, you know, data for science. They're sort of our piloting workstations that people use before they go to our labs that are still PC-based because um, lots of our labs, you know, we need very expensive expansion cards and things that are never going to have Mac drivers. So they're still PCs. But anyway, lab space is limited and precious. We want people to work from their desktop to get ready for that. Um, so we needed to emulate the lab somewhat. So I don't know if you can see that screenshot, but even on you know, an emula uh, sorry, a virtualized machine, the, the hardware, so the video card in that screenshot is still very much emulated. Um, and emulating is slow. Um, you know, companies like VMware will tell you how great games run on their software. And that's cool. You, know, you can trick someone into thinking you know, the refresh rate's fast enough, but when you're dealing with science, it's, it's not fast enough. Um, you know, so, so we have to strive for millisecond accuracy sort of at, at all times. Um, and just to give you a, a demonstration of that, 
um, there's this tool we use called DMDX, which is what we show you know, our stimuli with and record the responses. So on this left screen here is, um, oh, sorry, it, it has this component called TimeDX that basically you can use to calibrate and test out how good your, your hardware is for, for what you need to do. Um, so on the left here, I think it started, is, yeah, so we're running this tool TimeDX that tests the card. And so you can see this is measuring the refresh rate, and you shouldn't be able to see those little things flickering. So at 60 hertz, that should be a nice blur. So straight away, you can tell this is pretty garbage. Um, and then we'll just kick off a more advanced test that's basically just running an internal clock, and it's telling you how many times the screen's been refreshed, um, what the refresh rate is in milliseconds, and you can see that's changing, which is terrible. That shouldn't be the case. And then it's telling you, you know, that, do I think I'm doing this reliably? And you can see the error count is rocketing up. So you, you couldn't use this for science. So, and just to hammer the point home, this left window is the exact same computer, but running the same tool natively in boot camp. So you can see the refresh rates locked on to 16 milliseconds, 60 hertz, and there's zero errors. It's very accurate. Um, so that's why boot camp's important to us. Um, and so, you know, it's good that we're using boot camp, but you know, what, what was wrong with our old way of deploying boot camp? And the, the truth was, every time Apple released new hardware, we had to run up a big new monolithic image. And so you can see, after a couple of years, we had heaps of them. Um, uh, we weren't maintaining them, really. So a year or two down the track, they weren't useful anymore. Um, and we were using quite a few different tools to make them. So it was getting very hard and expensive to, to maintain. Um, and, you know, although there were benefits in giving everyone boot camp, we were getting some complaints back. Um, there was this idea of real Windows again. So every time something went wrong, goes wrong with um, Windows, people were blaming Apple, which was kind of weird. Um, and, you know, some of these problems were our fault too. Like, you know, once or twice we, you know, got new iMacs and deployed, deployed the images for the old one because we didn't realise that Apple had updated the model. And then also, when our campus changed to um, Active Directory for authentication, it exposed some real time synchronization problems that we had, and we had to fix that. Um, so, yeah, so what, what were our goals for making this better? Um, basically, we wanted to get to having one universal image, so one image and deploy it on any Mac hardware that we had or potentially get in the future. Um, we wanted to go to Windows 8.1 because we don't want to live in the past anymore. Um, and we want it to be driverless. So, so you know, that, that enables us, you know, if we can get a driverless image that downloads the drivers when the machine's first booting up, then in theory that works for any future hardware that comes down, down the pipe from Apple. Um, and we want it to be as far as possible unattended. So we just, you know, image the machine, boot it up, um, maybe come back in 20 minutes and do one or two post-install steps. Um, and we didn't really want to invest in new management tools. So we already had a couple of things and we wanted to keep using them, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, but, you know, we wanted to use the tools we had a bit smarter. Um, but in coming up with these goals, you know, we already had some ideas of how we'd do this. So. Um, Shortly before this, I'd come across this tool called uh, Brigadier, and it was from this blog post, um, which I kind of read it, and he's just sort of saying, you know, this guy's released a Python script that can download the boot camp drivers for the Mac that it's running on. So, you know, much like this Pete McKinney guy, I thought, holy crap, um, you know, fired up my terminal, downloaded the script and ran it. Um, and sure enough, it started doing exactly what it promised to do, which was, you know, realise what sort of Mac it was and download the boot camp drivers. Um, you know, so we thought this would work pretty, pretty well for what we're doing. Um, but just to say what Brigadier is, because it's important to the workflow, it's a Python script made by this guy called Tim Sutton. Um, it downloads the bootcamp drivers for whichever Mac it's running on at the time. Um, optionally, you can tell it to go ahead and install them, which is very useful. Um, it only works for 64-bit windows, um, but this isn't a problem to us because Apple only provides drivers for 64-bit windows um, for Windows 8, so no problems there. Um, and, you know, it's free where you can get it from this website. Um, but then importantly, on this website, he basically points out that, you know, you know, SysPrep is a tool that you can use to script the machine when it's booting up. and. So he's saying, you know, I believe this works in the context of, of SysPrep, so that seems promising. Um, and secondly, we, we've been using a tool called WinClone to make our bootcamp images for a long time. So 
Um, originally, this was freeware. It's just a graphical interface to um, you know, NTFS driver to, to build images of NTFS petitions. Um, sadly, it got discontinued, and that left us in a bind. Um, we had to sort of do a few hacks for a couple of years to keep using it. But you know, right when we needed it to, triumphantly, it came back, and the author brought it back as a commercial package. Um, you can get it from this Two Canoes website, and it's really actively developed now, which is um, good news. Um, so these are some of the things it does. Um, and then lastly, you know, we found out that you can use it to create Apple package installers of your, of your image. And so theoretically, if you've got a package installer, you can do a lot with that. Um, you can see that it's $4.99 for a site license. So it's, it's pretty cheap. You know, just go ahead and get the site license. Um, I'll come back to why later. Um, so yeah, you will use that to make package installers. Um, you know, so, so what did we do to go ahead and, and automate this process? So, you know, first thing you ought to do is build your reference computer, the one that you're going to copy to everything else. So, um, you know, as long as, you know, you can find it on this Apple website and it supports Boot Camp 5, which is the Windows 8.1 drivers, go ahead and get the newest Mac you've got and install Windows on it. Um, really, if you can build your reference computer on a model that has the built-in Ethernet, um, because Windows 8 already has the driver, or sorry, a, a generic driver for that pre-installed, um, which is useful. Um, so I'm sure most of you have installed Boot Camp before, so you know, go ahead, insert your USB stick, build an installer, um, you know, run through the, the Boot Camp Assistant steps. Um, yeah, so, so, so this is Apple's way of downloading the boot camp drivers. It's extremely slow. I don't know why this step takes about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and yeah, it, you, you can't scale this. It's only for manual installs. Um, yeah, so basically go ahead and install Windows as you always would. And basically when it's finished um, and restarts, we now need to interrupt Windows and tell it don't complete setting up because we need to you know, do some configuration before we image it. Um, you know, so once it's restarted and it's presenting you with the sort of the out of box experience, the first you know, configuration screens for the Windows installer, you want to stop it. Um, so basically, yeah, when you see this, press Control Shift F3, which interrupts it and goes into what's called um, audit mode. Um, Audit mode just logs you in with the, the built-in administrator for Windows. Um, if any of you do Windows as your job, you'll know this backwards. Um, and so once you're in audit mode, um, you can basically configure user account settings in that mode, and they'll be applied to the default user template that every user that logs into the computers that you've made from this image, they'll get the settings that you change now. Um, so, yeah, so now that you're in audit mode, you need to do a few things. You need to get online so you can configure it. Um, yeah, if you have used a Mac like, you know, this Retina Pro that doesn't have a, a, an Ethernet built in, go ahead and get the, the dongle. Um, that USB media you made earlier, the drivers for that are on there. Um, you can go ahead and pull this file off and install it. But additionally, leave a copy of it behind on the root of the C drive, and I'll come back to why later. Um, you can make some changes now in the local group policy that will um, just make the Windows 8 transition a lot nicer for people who've not used it before and maybe don't want to use it. Um, you can disable all those annoying first in, sorry, first sign-in animations about how to use Windows 8 because if you're in a lab and you've used a different computer every day, you've seen it 20 times, you don't need to see it anymore. Um, and the getting started screen at it's, it's sign-on. Um, people don't need to see that all the time, um, especially if they use a lot of computers. And one of the things we changed to was to block signing in with your Microsoft account. Maybe that's not necessary, but we did it anyway. Um, yeah, and so basically you just want to stop this annoying stuff. Um, people are going to have a hard enough time moving the Windows 8 anyway. You don't want to pester them with unnecessary information. Um, so yeah, basically, really quickly, now you just install all of the software that you need to use. You know, nothing strange here, configure it. Um, there is a bit of a problem in Windows 8.1 installing any Windows update you want at this stage. And you know, we don't really want to install Windows updates at this stage because it's a moving goalpost and you'll always be behind once you've made your image. But when Windows 8 
0.1 was launched, um, on the start menu, it still had no shutdown button. And so people would use it and not know how to turn their computer off. And they'd be ringing us and we'd be fielding a lot of inquiries about it. So when we were making this sort of, you know, improved automated image, we wanted to get that back. So we had to install the Windows updates beforehand because there was one that puts a power button back. So uh, Windows 8.1 won't do it, disables it. Um, there's a PowerShell script you can download that'll, that'll do it. Um, yeah, and so we only did that because basically we wanted to get this power button back and just save a lot of uh, confusion for our end, end users. Um, that's the website you can get the PowerShell script from. I won't go into how to run it. All the instructions are, are there. Um, yeah, so basically after that, you want to configure the start screen experience for the people because they've not seen it before, and this is the big sticking point with Windows 8. So, you know, you can see, you know, there's all these live tiles here that you have no control over the content in them, so maybe that's not appropriate for you, so you want to remove them. Um, and also, you can see on this screen that all the Microsoft stuff is hogging a lot of the real estate, and that would be much better taken with your apps, um, you know, because people want to just sit down and use the computer. They don't want to figure out how Windows 8 works. Um, and so there's a couple of PowerShell commands you can use to delete all the Microsoft apps. Um, this will be online later if you need to record what they are. Um, yeah, and, and even Microsoft, you know, says to avoid installing new uh, new apps because it'll probably break your sysprep later on. Um, if you really want, I mean, there are ways to sideload apps and all this stuff, but I just really don't want to know that much about Windows 8 at the minute, so I'll just remove the Microsoft ones and move on. Um, so yeah, so this is our start screen. You can go ahead and pin your own applications there. Um, I think most of you will agree that's a lot more you know, friendly to an end user than what was there before. Um, but just on customising the tiles and you know, sysprep, um, I spent weeks tearing my hair out over this issue and following online guides and just not having them work and just having no idea what was going on. I said a lot of swear words. but. Um, what I found out in the end was I was using Windows Pro and didn't even realise it. Um, switched that to Windows Enterprise, every guide I found worked brilliantly. I d never really looked into it, but just use Windows 8 Enterprise. I'm sure we're all licensed for it in universities anyway. Um, you know, so once you finish with audit mode, just go ahead and shut down your computer. Um, you've done all of your pre-imaging configuration. And what we need to do now is use a, a Microsoft tool called SysPrep that basically configures and scripts that out-of-box experience of all the things that we need to happen after the machine's been imaged and is starting up for the first time. So, you know, it does things like, you know, generalises the driver set, removes them so that it can be deployed onto new hardware. It resets the Windows security identifiers, which is really important if you're joining an uh, Active Directory domain as well. You know, uh, resets the computer name, a bunch of things to, you know, generalise that computer. Um, it's in that directory. If you run it just, you know, with no extra configuration, you get that screen, click OK, and you've got a machine you can image. But, you know, we need to kind of automate this a bit more. So um, you can create an XML file, which is just a list of instructions for it to go ahead and run after it's uh, been imaged and rebooting. So I'll just uh, go ahead and show you how to do that. The, uh, the tool you need to use, is, so you need to download this thing called the Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit, um, which gives you a lot of stuff. Um, you can use it to make Windows uh, pre-execution boot USB sticks and stuff, but you don't really need that. Um, uh, install it on your computer. This isn't something you install on the reference computer. Um, and the tool that we need to use in it is called Windows System Image Manager. Um, that's what it looks like. It's a little confronting the first time you see it, especially if you're not a, a Windows admin like me. Um, but basically all it does is it attaches to a Windows install media, builds a catalogue of things that you can configure, and then you basically um, drag those components you want to configure into a workflow, so in the middle, and then just tell it what you want to automate. Um, I'll apologise for these slides in advance. They're quite boring, these next 10 coming up. I'll go through them quickly and just elaborate on the ones that are important for boot camp. Um, so if you keep running sysprep a number of times on the same computer, eventually it'll stop working. Um, so this skip rearm setting just tells it to ignore that. Don't rely on this. Before you sysprep the computer, make an image of it, you can always go back to it. Um, 
basically things we need to do. So that audit mode administrator account we're in, it's got the name administrator, like every other Windows computer, we want to disable that. So um, you can just tell it to go ahead and disable that. Um, uh, yeah, Windows will want to automatically activate. Um, we haven't even given it a product key yet, so we want to go ahead and just disable that. Um, and so this step's important. So um, you want to tell it to you know, copy the user profile that we configured in, configured in audit mode and make that the default for every subsequent user. So that's just the, the setting copy profile that tells that to occur. Um, you, know, you can tell it uh, what time zone to use, which is one of those screens that you would configure if you were setting up Windows manually. Um, and when SysPrep's finished, we want it to log in as a user to do some things later. So uh, basically, we're just at this stage giving it the account credentials of an account to use. This account doesn't exist yet. We'll configure that later. Um, so this is something that's specific to Boot Camp. So if you've got a machine that's been imaged and it's booting up, but it has no Ethernet card in it, it's not going to be online. So the idea that we could download the drivers will fail. So um, at this stage, that driver that we got before for the USB to Ethernet dongle, it's sitting on the C drive. Um, and so that, along with some other things that we'll use in the script later, we just want to script a command to move them to the new local administrator we're going to create, their desktop, so that we can use them later. Um, yeah, and so once it's there, then we can add a command that just installs the Ethernet drivers for that USB card. Um, and then once that's installed, we want to just tell SysPrep to pause the machine for 15 seconds, which gives the Ethernet card just long enough to activate because it's just been installed and get an address from DHCP. Um, none of this is necessary if the computer has built-in Ethernet because it already has the driver, but um, it doesn't hurt to install it in advance. Um, and so now that the computer's online, we can invoke this Brigadier tool to go off and download the drivers dynamically for the computer that's just starting up. So, um, you know, this Python script has a compiled executable you can download. Um, so that's it there. So basically, you're just saying, run the Brigadier executable, uh, give it an option to tell it to go ahead and install it once it's downloaded the bootcamp drivers, and then just to output those drivers that it downloads to the local administrator's desktop, because we might use them again in a month or a year or something. Um, Brigadier claims to be able to download 7-zip, you know, use a 7-zip to uncompress the Apple packages, but we've found that this only works sometimes. So have 7-zip pre-installed, it'll save you some dramas. Um, yes, yeah, so the Windows system assessment tool, you might have seen this if you're using Windows, um, this sort of... Um, assessment score you get that Windows uses to optimise how the UI is laid out and looks. Um, that, we interrupted that when we interrupted the out-of-box experience. Um, and so Windows doesn't know how capable the computer is. And because that's never run before, and it's only just had the correct drivers installed, we now just need to tell Windows, go ahead and run this, give yourself a score, and you know, optimise yourself increasingly. Um, this GUI, you don't see it in Windows 8.1 anymore, it's deprecated, but Nevertheless, the technology is still there. Um, so basically, you can add a command to your sysprep workflow just to go ahead and run that from the command line. Um, and so I touched on time synchronization earlier. This is, was a big problem for us. So um, basically, what the problem is is that OS X always assumes that the internal clock is in UTC universal time. Um, so, you know, if it's 9 o'clock, OS X writes 9 o'clock to the internal clock. Then you reboot the machine into Windows. Windows um, basically assumes the internal clock is written in whatever time zone it's configured in. So if Windows is at you know, 11 o'clock PM, Australian Eastern, which is 9 o'clock UTC, it goes ahead and changes the clock to 2300 hours, um, which is all right. Um, Windows is quite aggressive when it's booting up, syncing the time with the domain controller, so you don't see problems. But the problem is when the Mac user reboots, and OS X goes ahead and looks at the clock and says, cool, it's 11 o'clock, when, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not. So, well, sorry, it's not 11 o'clock UTC. 
And so then if you're trying to log into a Windows domain or anything that involves Kerberos, it's really time sensitive, lots of failures, people can't log in, blame Apple. Um, but it's really easy to fix. So you can just set a registry key that tells Windows work the same way as the Mac does and just assume the clock's always in UTC. Um, the registry key is called real time is universal, set it to true, those problems go away. Um, as part of Bootcamp, Apple, it, Apple does install this Apple Time service, and if you look at the properties for that service, it claims to stop this from happening. I've never seen evidence that this works. Um, so you can just go ahead in your workflow and disable the Apple Time service. It's a service that's not required. And when we're installing Windows, we want it to be optimised to get that fast timing. Any service that doesn't need to be installed gets disabled. Um, but, you know, you've probably got lots of Windows machines that aren't also were deployed previously, not with this image you're making now. So you can also set these same registry keys uh, via group policy. Um, but the problem is, is you really don't want to be pushing this registry key out to non-Apple PCs. Um, so basically, yeah, in group policy, you can set a thing called a WMI filter, which just runs this really simple sort of SQL query that basically just says to the computer, tell me who your manufacturer details are. If it starts with the term Apple, it's an Apple computer. And so our group policies basically run this. If the answer is true, it's a Mac, apply the time sync changes. And that you know, fixes up the problem for computers you've already got. Um, uh, just a little bit more on the, the sysprep workflow. Um, you know, you can go, go ahead and just tell it uh, now to activate. We're using a... a, a, a key distribution server on campus, so we don't have to provide a key. Um, but if you do, just add a command before that that applies the license key you need to apply. Um, lastly, you can you know, script a domain join script, and these are easy to find online. Find one that suits you to join your Active Directory domain, if you have one. Um, but we also we need to delete this later, because it's got passwords in it. Um, and then the last step is we just want to install our antivirus. And we didn't do that in the, the image in audit mode because our antivirus install uses the machine name to register into an antivirus console. So it makes it, it's appropriate for it to happen now after the machine name's been changed. Um, yeah, and then just lastly, there's a few other um, OOVE screens that we can just tell it to skip because they're not relevant to us. Um, set your network location to work and configure Windows updates to install either all updates or Windows updates only or whatever's appropriate for you. And lastly, we just give it the uh, username and password for a local user account to create so that we've disabled the admin account. We want there to be at least one user there when the machine's finished. Um, yeah, so look, we've built our answer file, so what do we need to do to finish up? We just need to save that answer file, put it in the root drive of our reference computer, create a script that goes in this Windows setup scripts directory, which basically is just there. It'll be automatically executed when sysprep's finished, and it goes ahead and deletes any files you've left behind that have um, uh, user accounts in them, password details that you don't want your end users snooping around and finding. Um, so basically, on your reference machine, you've put all your sysprep information there. You can just go ahead and kick it off from the command line. Um, you're just telling it to you know, set the machine up for imaging. And you want to make sure you tell it to shut down, because if that machine reboots, it's going to start configuring itself. And you've probably lost a lot of work. And you'll have to go back and start the whole thing again. Um, so yeah, so your image is ready. And so you know, now we can look at the tools we use to actually create the image file that we're going to use. So, um, we've always used WinClone. This is the new image for it. Um, you can create basic WinClone images, but with those image files, you need to have WinClone on the machine to restore it, and it's a manual process, but you can do it. Um, you can also convert those images into self-extracting images, so where you just move the image file to the computer and double-click it, and it will install. And, you know, that's OK, but that's not really what we want either. Um, you can also create Apple package installers from this interface. Um, Go through that a bit later. Um, and you can configure WinClone to remove very large paging files from the, the computer before you image it. Um, we had an example of a lab where we had Mac Pros with terabyte hard disks in them. And when we petitioned them for boot camp, that went down to 500 gigabytes. But then the machines had 128 gigabytes of RAM. So it was creating 128 gigabyte hibernation files and paging files. Um, 
so actually, one thing I didn't talk about was we've also dis disabled hibernation. Um, but yeah, you can, you can configure how boot camp works in the preferences. Um, yeah, and so you can delete these files, no problem. Windows recreates them and it boots up. So yeah, so and once you've got your WinClan images, it, it, it's not doing anything you know, really magical. It's just basically taking your you know, you know, 10 or 20 gigabyte image and just wrapping it in a package installer. Um, you know, so as a result, they're really easy to create. You just tell um, WinClan, go ahead and turn the image I've already got into a package. Um, it, it assigns um, package identifiers to the package, which is important if you're you know, using deployment tools like um, Monkey or something that can query the receipts database. You can use this information to have those tools identify if you've already deployed Windows to a machine. And if you have, was it a version older or newer than the one you're trying to deploy? Um, the Windows packages can also partition your hard disks for you. Um, it's worth remembering that this is very destructive, but you know, there's basically three ways of doing it. You can go ahead and have it just partition the drives of uh, equal size or as a percentage of a whole drive. So you could have like a 50-50 deployment is what we generally do. Um, and that last option, if you want to restore to partition four, um, you might have a whole bunch of machines that you know, you've already partitioned and you know which partition number is the one you want to restore to. Um, so basically it's really fast because it's not creating the image, it's just using one you've already created. Um, yeah, and just quickly, you know, re uh, restoring these things, you know, you can use WinClone to just do it manually. Um, or what we want to do is, you know, use, it, use our package installer for something. So, um, you know, you can run it manually. It looks like any other package installer. Get warnings about it being destructive, which some people don't understand. Um, and so things you can do after deploying your image, you can... Uh, uh, you know, shrink or expand the size of the NTFS position. So when you're creating the image, you want to shrink it down to the smallest possible size because once you've imaged it, you have to have a partition bigger than the size of your image to be able to restore. So if you make a disk image of a one terabyte drive, you can't restore it to a 500 gigabyte drive. So, you know, let WinClone sort that out for you. Um, and another thing is if, if, if you've made your image on a brand new Mac with a USB install media that you've made, um, that's probably... Windows 8 or 8 and 8.1 can do native EFI booting. So um, that image expects there to be, you know, a compatible EFI there to boot. But if you're restoring this to an older Mac um, that relies on there being, you know, a master boot record or an emulated BIOS to boot, um, that would be a big problem. But, you know, uh, WinClone's really good at just, you know, changing the boot parameters for you and sorting that out. So that's a useful tool. Um, so yeah, so one of the things you know, we do quite simply is one of the tools we already used quite a bit was Apple Remote Desktop. We're not so big that we've, we've outgrown that. Um, but it should work via any deployment mechanism you have that supports uh, package installers. So as far as I can tell, Deploy, Deploy Studio, Casper, Monkey can all do this. Um, uh, so when you're using Remote Desktop, uh, these packages aren't signed, so you have to basically tell it to use untrusted certificates. So this is just an example of a you know, how we might deploy an image to a, to a, to a machine. Um, so the, that'll just go ahead and transfer the image through remote desktop to the, to the target. This is obviously sped up. I don't have a network that this, that's this fast. Um, and then when it's finished, it executes the, uh, the post install scripts in the package and goes ahead and performs the partitioning and the imaging. Um, it should finish in a second, and that's it. So now when we reboot it, it's going to start up and kick off those uh, sysprep scripted tasks that we uh, uh, talked about earlier. Um, so I, I was going to demo that with a, a live machine, but then I realised it takes 20 minutes and I didn't want to bore you that much. So I've, I've made a video of it and, and sped it down to like two minutes, which I'll show you in a sec. But um, just before I get to that, um, just uh, talk about core storage. So um, Fusion Drive Macs have always been, you know, core storage volumes. Um, and Yosemite, I believe, now even installs the core storage by default. Um, WinClone never really worked with core storage volumes up until very recently. Um, WinClone 5 now supports core storage. Um, but 
we're finding that it's not not 100% reliable, um, and certainly they they don't restore to fusion drive equipped Macs. Um, that's not to say we can't image them with our, our wing clone images, but not the package installers. Um, yeah, so basically, um, this is a bad video I took with my, my iPhone, um, just of a machine starting up after it's been restored. Um, and it's sped up about, oh, I don't know, about 50 times or something. It takes about half an hour or 20 minutes, usually. It depends on how fast your computer is. So this is just the machine. It's been generalized. It's just installing some generic drivers now. Um, And so, yeah, so it's uh, rebooting. And so at, at this stage, um, we didn't configure the PC name in SysPrep because we want to configure that ourselves. So that was just me typing in the PC name, that one part that we haven't automated. Um, now it's logging in as a user account. And this normally would be all, the, all you would see until it was finished. But as soon as the keyboard becomes available, I've just pressed Control Alt Delete, and you can break past this screen by going to Task Manager. And I'll just quit Task Manager, and so now we'll actually see what our um, SysPrep uh, workflow is doing. So this is it waiting for 15 seconds for the USB dongle to turn on and get an IP address. Um, it's now invoking Brigadier, which is downloading the correct uh, bootcamp drivers from Apple software update. Um, and so now 7-Zip's going to start unpacking those drivers. And it's unpacking the, the Apple Bootcamp package. So you'll see there's drivers in there for Windows 7 and bits of hardware that aren't in this computer. But that's OK, because once the Bootcamp installer starts, it's deciding which bits of hardware to install. Um, you can't really see that, but this is the Bootcamp installer starting. You'll recognize it if you've ever run this manually. Um, so it's installing the NVIDIA driver. The screen should flicker. Um, I think this is a 2011 MacBook Pro I did this on. So yeah, so now that's finished. It's uh, you know, got its drivers, so it's running that Windows uh, system assessment tool because um, it can get a sensible reading now from it. Um, so after that, it's just going ahead. Now it's joining our Active Directory domain. Uh, that was successful. And so now it's just going to go ahead and boot into Windows. Um, and so you'll see in a second, oh, it's a bit cut off, but um, those packages we wanted to be on the desktop are there. And oh, actually, you definitely can't see it, but in the task manager, our antivirus is installing and um, doing those sorts of things. So you know, it was fairly hands off for us, and we can just you know um, come back and uh, you know log out, and it's ready for the user. Or in fact, in some cases, we might um, you know do this over the phone with an end user if they're trusted enough to type the machine name correctly and actually log out at the end and not exploit the fact that they're logged in as the local admin. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, the whole process has been useful for us. If anyone's got any questions, um, just let me know. Cheers.